Senator from Iowa. I ask that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Uh, Madam President, uh, here we are again in the Senate, yet another day when families and students across this country are wondering if we're going to do our duty. Are we actually going to move legislation that will keep the interest rates at 3.4 percent on subsidized student loans, or are we going to let it go to 6.8 percent, double, in July, on July the 1st? We have legislation. We brought it to the floor, yet my Republican colleagues uh, yesterday voted not to even proceed on it, not even to proceed on it. Well, I think the people of America say, well, you know, <laughs> this shouldn't happen. We, we should be able to work these things out, and we should move, move legislation, not obstruct it. Everyone now agrees that we should keep it at 3.4%. Republicans say they want to keep it at 3.4 percent. We say we do. Republicans initially uh, were opposed to this, but they've gotten on board. That's fine. Uh, I've been here on the floor listening to my colleagues talk about this since Monday. Uh, everyone agrees we've got to keep it at 3.4 percent, not let it go up. So it ought to be a bipartisan issue. We ought to be able to move this rapidly and move on to other matters. There are other issues confronting us here in the Senate. And here we are again on the floor again today discussing the student loan interest rate. As I said, we had the vote yesterday just to move it forward, but my Republican colleagues blocked us from doing that. So they said they're, they agreed that we should keep it at 3.4, but not on how to pay for it. Well, okay, fine. Uh, that's a legitimate point of debate and discussion and votes. So. We just move the bill forward, bring it to the floor. Let's have a debate and discussion on, on how we pay for it. And if they want to offer their amendment, they can offer an amendment, and we'll vote on it. it. It seems to me, you know, at least I think that one of the responsibilities, and maybe maybe privileges, but responsibilities of the majority party in the Senate, whichever party it might be, is to initiate legislation and bring it to the floor. The privilege and responsibility of the minority party is to be able to amend it, try to make it better as they may see fit. I, I don't think it should be a privilege uh, and responsibility of the minority party just to block everything. But we've seen that happen more and more over the last few years, where Republicans just won't let us bring a bill to the floor, because under the rules it requires 60 votes rather than 51 votes to bring a bill forward. So. Again, here we're, we're stuck because we can't bring the bill forward. Well, I hope we have another cloture vote. Well, let's, you know, let's keep having these cloture votes, and, and maybe, maybe Republicans then will say, well, okay, let's move it forward, and, and let's debate it and move on. So I hope that's what we're going to be doing. Now, just don't, don't stop the process in its tracks. It's interesting to note that House and Senate Republicans were silent on this issue until students from around the country became aware of the impending increase and made their voices heard. The Democrats were already hard, hard at work on the solution. I would just remind my colleagues that earlier this year in the uh, budget uh, debate in the House, an amendment was offered by uh, Democrats during the House budget process to extend the current rate of 3.4%. That amendment lost by a straight party vote. Instead, the Republicans proposed that they pay for this by taking money from the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Now, again, this was not an appropriate solution. Killing the fund that's preventing cancer and preventing unnecessary diseases in the United States. My friends on the other side would have you believe that nothing bad will happen if we eliminate the Prevention and Public Health Fund. They call it a slush fund. There's no truth to that at all. The truth is that elimination of this fund would have disastrous effects on the health of our kids and our families. To eliminate, to eliminate the Prevention and Public Health Fund will cost us hundreds of billions of dollars in the future taking care of people who have chronic illnesses and chronic diseases and obesity. 
We know that an investment, to immunizing our kids, for example, to Im just immunize our kids for every dollar, it saves us $16 in saved health care costs. To eliminate this fund would lead to a resurgence of vaccine-preventable diseases in every state due to the expected loss of more than 1.5 million doses of life-saving vaccines and nearly 1,100 skilled public health workers. So again, eliminating the Prevention and Public Health Fund, eliminating vaccines for our kids, eliminating public health workers who know how to deliver these vaccines and respond to outbreaks, we would be losing public health staff at the state and local levels. Eliminating this fund would end support for increased calls to the tobacco quit line, meaning smokers encouraged to quit by the fund's strategic and evidence-based investments would not have the support to keep that quit line going. And if current smoking rates persist, six million kids living in the U.S. today will die from smoking, will ultimately die from smoking. We'll be forced, if we eliminate the public health fund and prevention fund, we'll be forced to reduce the availability of mental health and substance abuse services to very vulnerable Americans. Eliminating the fund, the prevention fund, as the Republicans want to do, would reduce investment in public health laboratory capacity at the state and local levels, thereby reducing the speed with which we can detect and respond to outbreaks and, yes, maybe even terrorist events. It would cut the number of disease detectives that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention can train and deploy. These disease detectives are our first line of defense against infectious diseases. Eliminating this fund would result in layoffs, as I said, of public health officials in every state and community that are working on chronic disease prevention, immunization, health care associated infections, and other health problems. An elimination of the prevention fund, again, I use the word elimination. The Republican proposal wouldn't just take some money from the prevention fund, it would kill the prevention fund. It would take every single penny out of it. Now, my friends on the Republican side said, well, you know, they said the other day, they said, well, President Obama in his budget took money out of the prevention fund. In fact, uh, Democrats joined with Republicans earlier this year in taking $5 billion out of the life of this fund to help pay for the uh, extending the unemployment insurance program the remainder of this year and also extending the, the uh, payroll tax cut. Well, they use that example as something like, where, well, then we can just kill the whole thing. But I was not, I must be very frank, I was not in favor of that $5 billion cut. But be that as it may, uh, as I used the analogy yesterday, uh, there's, there's one thing about taking a couple pints of your blood <laughs> and taking all your blood. I mean, you know, a person can live. You take a couple pints of blood, you can live and get healthy. And that's what's happened to the prevention fund. The prevention and public health fund is alive and well and doing its job, even though some money was taken out of it. What the Republicans want to do is take all the blood out of it, <laughs> kill the whole program. The president has said, President Obama has said that he would veto this bill if there were any cuts in the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Veto it. So there's been a line drawn. We took some money out of it before, but no more. That's it. No more money is coming out of this Prevention Fund because of the good that it's doing in this country. An elimination of this fund, what the Republicans want to do, would stop in midstream efforts across our country to address, to address the risk factors for heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and cancer, the leading causes of death and health care costs. Just yesterday, I read from a new Center for Disease Control and Prevention report that finds that if we could prevent the obesity rate from increasing past its 34 percent rate right now, we could save nearly $550 billion in the next 20 years. In 1980, the obesity rate was right at about 15% in this country. 
Today, as I said, it's 34 percent. 34 percent. If it increases at the rate that they expect, looking at everything out there now, 42 percent of all Americans will be obese by 2030, and one out of every four of them will be severely obese. That means a huge increase in adult onset diabetes and all the accompanying health care costs, heart disease, stroke, that accompany obesity. We know how to address it. We have evidence-based programs we know that work in keeping the obesity rate down. That's what the Prevention Fund does. Republicans want to kill it. They say, no, just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. Cuts to our chronic disease prevention program. It would mean 120 million Americans, one in every three citizens, would lose access to preventative services. $103 million no, no longer available to states and counties and local jurisdictions to provide these services. Over 20 million Americans in rural areas, rural areas in New York, rural areas in Iowa, and all across this country would no longer have access to pre preventative services and programs. Madam President, the American people get it. They, our citizens that we represent, they get it. They understand it. A poll was taken, said that voters overwhelmingly support more investment in prevention. This is, just, this is a 2009 poll, public opinion poll. 71% of Americans polled said yes, do more, invest more in prevention. 71%. Our fellow citizens are crying out to us for help. They want help. They want to know what to do. How do they change? What can we do in our communities, our schools, our workplaces, our clinics, our community health centers? What can we do so that I don't get sick, so that I don't get obese, so I don't get a diabetes, so I don't have heart disease. Because most people don't know what to do. They need some help. They need information. They need support. That's what this prevention fund does. And we know that it works. We know. I mean, we have evidence-based programs out there that work. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention is doing an outstanding job across this country in these programs from community programs to public health infrastructure to clinical preventative services, research, tobacco prevention programs, detection and prevention of infectious diseases, training and preparing public health workforce, all of this. That's why prevention is not just something that you go into a doctor's office and get a shot for, or you get a prescription for and you get a pill. Prevention encompass, encompasses a lot of different things. Everything from newborn screening, uh, immunizations for children, school-based programs, better food and nutrition in our school meals for kids, communities, communities change the way they operate and they do things, more walking paths, more bike paths. I said the other day that was, there was some Something being said about Illinois had used some of this for, for, for signage and, 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 and walking paths for kids. And I pointed out, yes, they did. And what happened is the number of kids walking to school increased, and that cut down the number of buses they had to use, and it saved the school system money. And the kids got healthier. I often use the example that I, I, uh, when I first moved here to, to Washington in, in, in 1979, when I was in the house, my wife and I purchased a home out in Virginia. We still live there. And one of the reasons we bought it because we were about, about a mile away from the school, high school. We thought, that's great. Kids can just walk to school. Little did I know, there were no walking paths to school. We were on a, there was a busy street. There was a sidewalk for little ways. And then there wasn't one. Kids couldn't walk. So they had to take a bus just to go a mile. <laughs> so. Again, communities putting in kind of sidewalks, safe passages, 
for kids to do that. That's healthy living. I, I've seen instances in my own state where communities have put walking paths for the elderly, for senior citizens. So they don't have a lot of steps and things to go up and down, and you'd be amazed how many people use that and stay healthy. Supporting systems in our workplaces, making our workplaces more, helping businesses understand what they can do uh, to provide a healthier workplace for people. Uh, examples abound all over this country. I'm sure I don't know all the instances in New York State, but I'll bet you communities there have gotten together and thought about how do they make life a little bit more healthy? How do they support a more healthy infrastructure for their people? And in some communities, they're coming up with very ingenious ideas. And I say more power to them. That's what the Prevention Fund is for, is to help them, to encourage them, to give them the kind of support that they, that they need to provide that healthy living. I've said many times that, you know, it's interesting that in America, it's easy to be unhealthy and hard to be healthy. You would think it should be the other way around. It should be easy to be healthy and harder to be unhealthy. It's just the other way around. So what we're trying to do with some part of the prevention fund, not all of it, some part of it, is to make it easier to be healthy, to make that an easier option for people. So if we both agree, Republicans and Democrats, on the fact that we need to keep it at the interest rate on student loans at 3.4 percent, then the debate just is really on the offset. And as I've said, the Republicans want to kill the prevention fund. The American people have said loudly, no, we don't. We want more investment in prevention. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to get obese. We want to quit smoking. We want our kids to be healthy. We want them to have healthier food, better exercise. And the Republicans are saying, well, we're just not going to do that. I guess we'll pay more for it in chronic illnesses and diseases down the line. Well, our offset is one I think that is legitimate and sound, closing a loophole in the tax code that means more money would go into the Social Security and Medicare Trust Fund. And it would help us keep the interest rates at 3.4%. Education is always, and I hope will always remain, a bipartisan issue here. I urge my Republican colleagues to come to the table with a serious offset, a serious offset. If they don't like what we have proposed, please come with something that's serious. Eliminating the prevention fund is a no-starter. As the President said, he would veto it. So why push it? So this is an opportunity, I think, for all of us to come together and show the American people that this body is not broken. We can work with each other and get things done for the good of our people. I, I, again, I encourage my Republican colleagues to allow us to move forward on the bill. Don't keep blocking it. If they want to offer a different offset, fine. I mean, not this one, not, not, not the elimination of the prevention fund, because that's not serious. That's not going anywhere. If they have some other ideas, bring it forward. As of yet, we've seen nothing from my Republican colleagues, other than stopping the bill. Stopping it, stopping it, stopping it. So I hope that they will come to the table, and I hope we can move this bill forward. Madam President, I yield the floor. Senator from Michigan. I commend my friend from Iowa for his being such a phenomenal champion of preventative health care. He's He's been fighting for this as long as he's been in the Senate, and uh, he's had some great victories. He's had some setbacks, but mainly victories, and it's because of his energy and effort that we are where we're at today in terms of getting this money for preventative health care and his continued effort here to fight for it and to preserve this fund is uh, notable. It's going to succeed, and if it does and when it does, it'll be mainly because of our friend from Iowa. Madam President, our Republican colleagues uh, could have allowed us yesterday to begin debate on legislation to fix the looming increase in student loan interest rates. They could have helped us uh, avoid adding to the already crushing weight of student debt the, that the uh, families of our country face. They could have joined us in taking a step toward letting parents do what parents desperately want to do which is to help their kids to a better future. 
American families are waiting for us to act. On July 1st, the interest rate on student loans is going to increase from 3.4% to 6.8%. It's going to double unless we act. Now, that's going to cost over 7 million college students and their families an average of $1,000 a year. That's $1,000 that most families do not have to spare. More than 7 million students and their families nationwide would be affected. So the need to act is urgent. <coughs> in what has come to be a damaging ritual here in the Senate, Republicans have filibustered a motion to proceed to important legislation. Republicans have voted against even allowing the United States Senate to begin to debate a bill. Why not debate it? Why not offer relevant amendments? Why not address this important issue? No, by their filibuster, our Republican colleagues have refused to let the Senate even start this process. The Republicans say that they, too, want to prevent this increase in student loan interest rates. They, they differ with, with us, they say, on how to pay for it. Republicans say the only way they're going to support this legislation to prevent this rate increase is with cuts from a fund that helps to prevent infectious and chronic diseases. Now, the program that Republicans seek to eliminate has provided more than $8 million to my state to help fight major health problems such as influenza and diabetes, HIV, heart disease, and cervical cancer. These funds even help to provide funding for childhood immunization programs. So what the Republicans propose is this. Choose between helping college students and their families and helping to prevent expensive and debilitating health problems. Choose between education and health care choosing to allow more health problems in order to help students and their families is not a choice at all. Democrats are offering a, dim a different alternative. We recognize that the tax code is full of loopholes and special breaks that allow some individuals and some corporations to avoid paying taxes. In this case, what's identified is a tax break that allows some professional service providers such as lawyers, to avoid paying their payroll taxes by organizing their businesses as so-called S-corporations and then paying themselves in the form of dividends instead of salaries. <coughs> the Government Accountability Office recently examined this issue and found widespread problems costing taxpayers and the tax and the Treasury billions of dollars each year in uncollected revenues. Now, what our bill would do is require that professional service providers with incomes above $250,000 a year pay payroll taxes on the income that they derive from these S corporations. We would use the revenues from closing that loophole for those with incomes above $250,000 to prevent the interest rate hike that's going to hit middle-income families. And at the same time, we're going to be able to do that. We're also going to avoid increasing the deficit or slashing important programs. Our Republican colleagues have accused us, to quote one of them, of raising taxes on, quote, the people that are doing some of the very serious job creation in this country, close quote. Well, not long ago, Madam President, Republicans were saying something different about this loophole. For starters, they actually called it a loophole. That's what former Vice President Cheney called it during his 2004 vice presidential debate. He called it, quote, a special loophole. He accused his debate opponent of dodging $600,000 in payroll taxes using this loophole. Likewise, a Republican candidate for Senate not long ago called this a, quote, deceptive tax scheme to get around the IRS, close quote. There were no Republican cries then about raising taxes on job creators. The fact of the matter is that this loophole ought to be closed, no matter who is taking advantage of it, Democrats or Republicans, and closing it, at least for those with incomes above $250,000, in order to avoid another blow 
in a long series of blows to middle-income Americans just makes sense and is fundamentally fair. Hundreds of thousands of students in my state of Michigan depend on student loans to help afford college. They and their families know that college is not going to get any cheaper. They don't need a doubled interest rate on top of tuition increases. For many, an affordable loan is the difference between staying in school or giving up the dream of a college education. We should not let this loophole stand in the way of those dreams. I urge our Republican colleagues to end their filibuster of this vital bill. If Republicans think they have a better way, let us debate their alternative and let us vote. Let us end this filibuster. Let us end it today. Madam President, uh, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum. I'm a, I'm a Floor, do not note the absence of a quorum. Madam President. Senator from Virginia. Uh, Madam President, uh, I ask unanimous consent to speak uh, for 15 minutes as in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I rise today to address perhaps the most important constitutional challenge facing the balance of power between the presidency and the Congress in modern times, and also to offer a legislative solution that might finally address this paralysis. It is an issue that has for far too long remained unresolved, and for the past 10 years, the failure of this body to address it has diminished the respect, the stature, and the seriousness with which the American people have viewed the Congress, to the detriment of our country and to our national security. The question is simple. When should the president have the unilateral authority to decide to use military force? And what is the place of the Congress in that process? What has happened to reduce the role of the Congress from the body which once clearly decided whether or not the nation would go to war to the point that we are viewed as little more than a rather mindless conduit that collects taxpayer dollars and dispenses them to the president for whatever military functions he decides to undertake? We know what the Constitution says. Most of us also know the difficulties that have attended this situation in the years that followed World War II. We are aware of the debates that resulted in the War Powers Resolution of nearly 40 years ago uh, in the wake of the Vietnam War, where the Congress attempted to define a proper balance between the President and this legislative body. I have strong memories of the policy conflicts from that era. First, as a Marine infantry officer who fought on the unforgiving battlefields of Vietnam, on which more than 100,000 United States Marines were killed or wounded. And later, as an ardent student of constitutional law during my time at the Georgetown University Law Center. But it was in the decades following Vietnam that our constitutional process seems to have broken apart. Year by year, skirmish by skirmish, the role of the Congress in determining where the United States military would operate and when the awesome power of our weapon systems would be unleashed has diminished. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, especially with the advent of special operations forces and remote bombing capabilities, the Congress seems to have faded into operational irrelevance. Congressional consent is rarely discussed. The strongest debates surround the rather irrelevant issue of whether the Congress has even been consulted. We have now reached the point that the unprecedented and quite frankly contorted constitutional logic used by this administration to intervene in Libya on the basis of what can most kindly be called a United Nations standard of humanitarian intervention was not even the subject of a full debate or a vote on the Senate floor. Such an omission and the precedent it has set now requires us to accept one of two uncomfortable alternatives. Either we, as a legislative body, must reject this passivity and live up to the standards and the expectations regarding presidential power that were laid down so carefully by our founding fathers, or we must accept a redefinition of the very precepts upon which this government was founded. This is not a political issue. Madam President, we would be facing the exact same constitutional challenges no matter 
the party of the president. And in fact, unless we resolve this matter, there is no doubt that we someday will. The conflict in the balance of power between the president and the Congress has always been an intrinsic part of our constitutional makeup. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution provides that the Congress alone has the power to declare war. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution provides that the President shall serve as Commander-in-Chief. In the early days of our Republic, these distinctions were clear, particularly since we retained no large standing army during peacetime and since Article 1, Section 8 also provides that the Congress has the power, and I quote, to raise and support armies, a phrase that expressed the clear intent of the framers that large ground forces were not to be kept during peacetime, but instead were to be raised at the direction of the Congress during a time of war. Our history confirms this, as our armies demobilized again and again once wars were completed. Only after World War II did this change, when our rather reluctant position as the world's greatest guarantor of international stability required that we maintain a large standing military force, much of it in Europe and in Asia, ready to respond to crises whose immediacy could not otherwise allow us to go through the lengthy process of mobilization in order to raise an army and because of that reality made the time-honored process of asking the Congress for a formal declaration of war in some cases obsolescent. But any logical proposition can be carried to a ridiculous extreme. The fact that some military situations have required our presidents to act immediately before then reporting to the Congress does not in and of itself give the president a blanket authority to use military force whenever and wherever he decides to. Even where Americans are not personally at risk and even where the vital interests of our country have not been debated and clearly defined. This is the ridiculous extreme that we have now reached. The world is filled with tyrants. Democratic systems are far and few between. I don't know exactly what objective standards should be used before the United States government would decide to conduct a so-called humanitarian intervention by using our military power to address domestic tensions inside another country. I don't believe anybody else knows either. But I will say this, no president should have the unilateral authority to make that decision either. Madam President, I make this point from the perspective of someone who grew up in the military, whose family has participated as citizen soldiers in most of our country's wars, beginning with the American Revolution. I was proud to serve as a Marine in Vietnam. I'm equally proud of my son's service as a Marine infantryman in Iraq. I'm also grateful for having had the opportunity to serve five years in the Pentagon, one as a Marine, and four as an Assistant Secretary of Defense, and Secretary of the Navy. And I've benefit, benefited over the years from having served in many places around the world as a journalist, including in Beirut during our military engagement there in 1983, and in Afghanistan as an embedded journalist in 2004. As most people in this body know, I'm one of the strongest proponents of refocusing our national involvement in East Asia, and I was the original sponsor of the Senate resolution condemning China's use of force with respect to sovereignty issues in the South China Sea. The point, Madam President, is that I'm not advocating a retreat from anywhere. But this administration's argument that it has the authority to decide when and where to use military force without the consent of the Congress, using the fragile logic of humanitarian intervention to ostensibly redress domestic tensions inside countries where American interests are not being directly threatened is gravely dangerous. It is a bridge too far. It does not fit our history. To give one individual such discretion ridicules our Constitution. It belittles the role of the Congress. And for anyone in this body to accept this rationale is also to accept that the Congress no longer has any direct role in the development and particularly in the execution of foreign policy. Madam President, there are clear and important boundaries that have always existed 
when considering a president's authority to order our military into action without the immediate consent of the Congress. To exceed these boundaries, as the president has already done with the precedent set in Libya, is to deliberately destroy the balance of power that were built so carefully into the Constitution itself. These historically acceptable conditions under which a president can unilaterally order the military into action are clear. If our country or our military forces are attacked, if an attack, including one by international terrorists, is imminent and must be preempted, if treaty commitments specifically compel us to respond to attacks on our allies, if American citizens are detained or threatened, if our sea lanes are interrupted, then, and only then, should the President order the use of military for force without first gaining the approval of the Congress. At least until recent months, the Congress has never accepted that the President owns the unilateral discretion to initiate combat activities without direct provocation, without Americans at risk, without the obligations of treaty commitments, and without the consent of the Congress. The recent actions by this administration, beginning with the months-long intervention in Libya, should give us all grounds for concern and alarm about the potential harm to our constitutional system itself. We are in no sense compelled or justified in taking action based on a vote in the United Nations or as the result of a decision made by a collective security agreement, such as NATO, when none of its members have been attacked. It is not the prerogative of the President to decide to commit our military and our prestige into situations that cannot clearly be determined to flow from vital national interests. Who should decide that? I can't personally inclusively and conclusively define the boundaries of what is being called a humanitarian intervention. Most importantly, neither can anybody else. Where should it apply? Where should it not? Rwanda, Libya, Syria, Venezuela, Bangladesh? In the absence of a clear determination by our time-honored constitutional process, who should decide where our young men and women in our national and our national treasure should be risked? Some of these endeavors may be justified. Some may not. But the most important point to be made is that in our system, no one person should have the power to inject the United States military and the prestige of our nation into such circumstances. Our Constitution was founded upon this hesitation. We inherited our system from Great Britain, but we adapted and changed it for a reason. One of our strongest adjustments from the British system was to ensure that no one person would have the power to commit the nation to military schemes that could not be justified by the interest and the security of the average citizen. President after president, beginning with George Washington, have emphasized the importance of this fundamental principle to the stability of our political system and to the integrity of our country in the international community. The fact that the leadership of our Congress has failed to raise this historic standard in the past few years, and most specifically in Libya, is a warning sign to this body that it must reaffirm one of its most solemn responsibilities. Madam President, I have been working for several months to construct a legislative solution to this paralysis. The legislation would recognize that modern circumstances require an adroit approach to the manner in which our foreign policy is being implemented. But it would also put necessary and proper boundaries around a president's discretion when it comes to so-called humanitarian interventions, where we and our people are not being directly threatened. My legislation requires that in any situation where American interests are not directly threatened, the President must obtain formal approval by the Congress before introducing American military force. This legislation will also provide that debate on such a request must begin within days of the request and that a vote must proceed in a timely manner. I would remind the leadership on both sides of this body that despite repeated calls from myself and other senators 
When this administration conducted month after month of combat operations in Libya with no American interests directly threatened and no clear treaty provisions in play, the Congress of the United States, both Democrat and Republican, could not even bring itself to have a formal debate on whether the use of military force was appropriate. And this use of military force went on for months and was never approved. The administration, which spent well over a billion dollars of taxpayer funds, dropped thousands of bombs on the country, operated our military offshore for months, claimed that combat was not occurring, and rejected the notion that the War Powers Act applied to the situation. I'm not here to debate the War Powers Act. Madam President, I'm suggesting that other statutory language that covers these kinds of situations must be enacted. The legislation that I will be introducing today will address this loophole in the interpretation of our Constitution. It will serve as a necessary safety net to protect the integrity and the intent of the Constitution itself. It will ensure that Congress lives up not only to its prerogatives, which were so carefully laid out by our Founding Fathers, but also to its responsibilities. And with that, I yield the floor and would suggest the absence of uh, floor. Madam President. Senator from Alaska. Are we in a quorum call? No. Uh, Madam President, I have eight unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I have asked unanimous consent that these requests be agreed to and that these requests be printed in the record. Without objection. Madam President, I come down to uh, talk about the issue of student loans. As someone who uh, has two ends of this equation, one first as a former chair of the Student Loan Corporation for the state of Alaska for seven years, uh, took that corporation from the brink of bankruptcy, junk bond rating, you name it, it was in dismal condition. We turned it around and seven years later the corporation ended up paying a, a hefty annual dividend to the state of Alaska for higher education, had one of the lowest interest rates in the country, and increased the capacity for uh, students to borrow money, not only for two-year, four-year uh, masters, but also for uh, career education, something that most people told me when I became chair of that corporation, it would never be able to be done. Good luck, we wish you the best, and off they went, and most of them got off the board very quickly. Uh, but we were able to bring it together, and in the process, uh, my experience around the issues of education and making sure young people had the capacity uh, to borrow money at reasonable rates, uh, and I think we were at one point down about 2%, uh, which is a pretty incredible rate uh, for a student to borrow money at, student or parent. Also, I was chair of the Post-Secondary Education Commission for seven years, uh, the, the uh, co-partner with Student Loan Corporation, making sure we had strong educational institutions to provide career college and other types of education for our young people. So I come with that experience, but I also come from the experience as a small business person, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, with regards to how we're trying to pay for this interest rate, uh, controlling this interest rate and making sure they don't rise. As you know, the interest rates for subsidized Stafford loans will rise from 3.4% to 6.8% in July. That would increase the average cost for students by $1,000 over the course of the loan. Students are truly waiting, and families are waiting. As kids are graduating right now across this country from uh, high school, getting ready to move on to higher education, uh, making their plans, may they be scholarships or grants or loans or whatever they can to cobble the amount of money they need to move on to higher education to ensure that they can afford it. Well, the interest rate is part of the equa equation. Doubling the interest rate would be damaging to our young families uh, who are making sure their, their kids can get on and have an opportunity to be educated. Uh, as you know, many of us, uh, Madam President, have gone onto our Facebook page and Twitter accounts and said, tell us your story from our districts. Tell us what's happening. If this happens, what will happen to you? One Anchorage resident says her granddaughter graduated from Charter College, and I know this college well. It's a privately run college. It uh, has an incredible placement rate, I think it's almost 90% placement rate once they graduate with their degree. It's an intensive program. Uh, it's like a job. You're there eight to five uh, every day, uh, all day, all week, for several months, uh, and they consolidate the time. But 
she has been working on her accounting degree uh, now six years later because she had to work two jobs while going to school, trying to pay for this and borrowing money. Her total debt is $72,000. She's 31 years old. Her family is truly wondering how she will ever get out of debt if this bill doesn't pass because if the interest rates are just, it's truly money that comes out of her pocket uh, into uh, literally uh, to pay off interest, and the net result is he keeps deeper and deeper in debt. You and we know the cost of college is more and more expensive every year, and how we are going to be able to make sure students can afford this is making sure that we do not double the interest rate. We had a vote earlier this week, did not succeed. We tried on this side to move it forward. Uh, it was interesting to me. And before, before I say this next comment, I want to say also, why is it important for us to make sure every kid has access to education, no matter higher education, career education, voc education, whatever the new title is they like to use around it? Uh, because we are in a global economy. We need to be competitive. Our young people are ready, willing, but we need to make sure they have the proper capacity and access to education. That means affordability. But, you know, it's interesting. Yesterday, I was listening uh, to the debate and... Uh, some of the people talking, and, and I want to be very clear about this. This is where my small business uh, part comes in. I, I've been in small businesses since the age of 14. I've operated and owned a variety of businesses, uh, some successful, some not so successful, but hopefully you learn from those not so successful, and I think I have. Uh, the Democratic pay for, the majority's pay for, was to close a tax loophole used by high income earners. Basically, Lawyers, lobbyists, consultants, no disrespect to their field, but they basically use the system to avoid paying Medicare taxes, for example, that all of us pay. And I mean all of us, all of us that sit here in this chamber and the people who work at the restaurant outside here and the people who drive the bus and everyone else pays that tax. But they use this to organize under an S corporation. It's a technical term under the IRS code that allows those profits to go right to the individual. So they decide instead of taking it as a wage, they take it as profit or dividend, thus avoiding Medicare taxes that all of us pay, getting a free ride. You know, I heard on the floor here yesterday, oh, a bunch of new taxes. These aren't new taxes. These are taxes that are owed. They just found a loophole. Again, consultants, lobbyists, lawyers who weave their way through the, the writing of the laws, and they probably wrote them. Actually, they did. If you look at the history of this, they wrote the law so they could avoid the Medicare taxes that everyone else has to pay. So when I heard people down here saying, oh, it's the restaurant owner, it's the retailer, it's the, the plumber, that's a bunch of baloney. That is so misinforming the public, it's unbelievable. I know this. Because as a former retailer who had an S corporation, we pay our taxes. We pay with a wage. We pay it all. This loophole is clearly, and all you have to do is, is look at it. They have to meet three standards. Modified gross income above 250 for joint filers, 200,000 for individual, individuals, and shareholder and S corporation that derives 75% or more of gross revenues from services of three or few shareholders. Services defined as lobbying, law, Engineering, architect, accounting, actuarial science, which is a science, uh, performing arts, athletes, brokerage services. I, I, I'm looking here. I don't see it. doesn't say retailers. doesn't see the, the mom and pop folks that are working every day. No, see, they pay their taxes. And so for members to come down here and trick the public, because that's what they did. They convoluted the words because people are just getting the sound bites, the 10 seconds. And they say, oh, it's going to raise new taxes and cause all these small businesses not to hire. Baloney. This is about lawyers, lobbyists, and consultants who wrote the law to make sure they didn't have to pay a dime. That's what it's about. And for people to come down here and say, we're going to not, we're going to raise the, the interest rate on hardworking families who are trying to get their kids to college is unbelievable. I hope we take this up again. I hope we vote on it and get this thing resolved, make sure working families can afford to get their kids into college and be able to afford the high cost 
so they can become productive parts of this country and be open their small business and pay their taxes like every other small business does. So I, 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 I was just appalled when I heard some of the people come down here. And they sounded so, so logical. But to be frank with you, there's not many in this body, no disrespect to my colleagues, that have owned and operated a true small business. One that you start with a few nickels and dimes, you get turned down by the bank because they tell you your idea is a dumb idea. I can tell you this in personal experience. And then later, three, a few years later, I sold it for three times what I invested into. So I don't know. I thought it was a good idea. Banker didn't. But who had to scratch together two nickels to make a business successful. Had to work 12, 15 hours every day to make sure it's successful. That's a small business person. There's not many in this body. And when they come down here, when people come down here and sound so professional about their description of how it's going to affect certain people, it's just incorrect. And one thing I wouldn't mind in this body is just really factual debates, because that's what the public deserves, not this kind of 10-second uh, media bite so they can get away with it and say back home, oh, we didn't raise taxes, we didn't do this. Uh, what they're really doing is they're jacking up rates on students. That's what's going to happen at the end of the day here. By July, when we don't take action here, and we have on this side, the end result will be that families, hard-working families, middle-class families will pay more for their students' education. Students will pay more for their education because of a simple law that all we have to do is close the loophole that lobbyists, lawyers, and consultants are taken advantage of and wrote to their advantage to stick it to the middle class. I think it's time to reverse the trend for once around this place, just once, and give the middle class just a little break here. A break they deserve and will build our economy in the future because we will have a highly educated workforce meeting this global economy. Last thing I'll just say, uh, Madam President, is I know there's another alternative out there. Oh, we'll have a new pay for. Well, here's what that does. It takes away prevention funds for health. $226 million to reduce diabetes and heart disease. I don't know about you, but if you don't prevent it, then you pay a higher cost later. And those are preventable diseases. This money is well invested. $93 million for anti-tobacco education. $190 million for immunization. So they don't like the one that closed the loophole on lobbyists, lawyers, and consultants, but they do like the one that takes away prevention programs that once again help our middle class, our young families, who might be experiencing signs of, a, of a preventable disease, heart disease, and a little prevention might save their lives, but also will save health care costs in the future. I, it's, it's, I see these proposals as crazy talk. I don't know how else to describe it. I'm trying to keep it simple. That let's get on with closing loopholes people took advantage of by lobbying and wheeling and dealing in the halls of Congress, fix that, and protect our working families, our middle class families, make sure that we're doing the right thing. That's what they sent us here to do, Madam President, and I think we have an obligation. So I hope, again, that we move forward and make sure that we're not going to double the rates. I'm not for doubling the rates. 3.4 percent is a good rate. We should ensure that students can get that as they get prepared for the fall session and borrowing money to get on with higher education. Madam President, thank you very much, and I uh, uh, yield the floor. Notice, note an absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
objection. I rise today to join my colleagues in calling for a real solution to the impending student debt crisis. Yesterday, we had a chance to do the right thing and stand with millions of young Americans all across our country by investing in their future, by preventing these interest rates from doubling on Stafford loans in just 52 days from now. But instead, our colleagues across the aisle chose to stand in the way of a common sense proposal. As a result, 7 million students are facing higher interest rates that will cost them each an extra $1,000 a year in interest, further pushing access to a quality higher education out of reach for too many and saddling others with additional unmanageable debt when they get out of college and join the workforce. You don't have to take it from me about how tough this is going to be. Take it from the students and the families themselves. Just as your office heard from thousands of families all across Alaska, we've been hearing the same online through email about what this would actually do to their families. I heard from one New York parent who has a child in college and another heading there this fall. Their older child spent a year in AmeriCorps. Their younger is now about to start the same. He said, these kids are serving America. Both of my kids will leave college with around $25,000 of debt if we can afford to keep it down that much. We should be able to all agree that adding another $1,000 or more per year in debt for kids who are only looking to serve this country, get a good education, and help rebuild this economy is just wrong. I heard from a woman in the Bronx. She, had a job, she has a job as a social worker. And she's on track to pay off her student loans in the next 10 or 11 years, just in time for her twin daughters to start college. She said, doubling my student loan interest will keep me in debt at a time when I am going to need every single penny to get my kids through college with, a little, with as little of debt of their own as possible. The more interest I pay, the more they'll have to borrow for their own education. And this cycle will continue indefinitely. I heard from a woman in Saratoga with a bachelor's degree in hotel resort and tourism management. Despite making good money, she says that paying her $800 a month in student loans on top of her everyday bills makes it getting by nearly impossible. She said, my choice is to instead decide what bill am I going to pay this month making me fall behind on other payments and destroying my credit in the future. If my interest rate was any higher, I honestly do not know how I would survive at all. Pretty much all the money I'm making is going straight into student loans. We need all the help we can get. These are just a few of the stories that I heard yesterday. And the families expect better from us. When we price young people out of a college education, we all are going to pay the price. When we limit their opportunity, we rob ourselves of those future engineers, bio biologists, and small business owners. America's ability to lead the global economy relies on our ability to out-educate the global competition. Let's open doors to higher education to anyone who's willing to work for it. And let's keep it affordable. Let's reward hard work and responsibility instead of risk taking. There's no excuse for inaction. So let's have a real debate in good faith to solve this problem that we all know is within our reach. Students and families all across America can't afford any more delay. Suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.